Yes, it is. If you have your Bible, turn over now to the book of uh, Luke. Luke chapter number 23. Verse number 33. Luke 23 and verse 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the male factors, one on the right hand, the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. A superscription also was written over him, letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. One of the male factors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed, justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, look carefully now, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, verily, I say unto thee, today. Shalt thou be with me in paradise. Father, bless this holy word and the messenger tonight that tries to give it forth. In your name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. You have to read something like this with reverence because this is a powerful place. This is a powerful place. What took place on this cross when the Lord Jesus Christ addressed the male factor, the criminal, never happened anywhere else. He had conversations with a lot of people, but this is unique. It only happened one time. Now Luke, of course you just read, Matthew also records the event. If you'd like to turn to the book of Matthew, he has in chapter 27, verse 44, a little bit to add to what you just read. Matthew chapter 27, verse 44. That's one of the good things about the Gospels. They complement each other. Sometimes you'll read about something in one and then read a little more about it in another one. In the book of in Matthew chapter number 27 and verse 44, the thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. And so Matthew tells you that both of them were mocking him. They were making fun of him. This was a, this was a, this was, this was as bad as it gets to mock Christ, make fun of him. Now, they're not the only ones. They're all standing around mocking him. The soldiers mocked him. The Jews mocked him. The criminals mocked him. He was enduring this from every quarter while he was hanging on the tree. The Lord Jesus Christ said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The earth got dark. It got real dark. This thief that had been mocking now began to watch he began to take in what was happening. He was part of it. And he noticed the darkness. The mockery ceased from him. The other thief continued to mock. Rail, scream, and yell. And in bitter vindictiveness. Hateful, uh, hateful anger and rage. Not considering for a moment that he was dying justly for the kind of life that he'd lived. The other man had begun to look at things differently. He began to realize by watching this man die, dying, he didn't die, but he's watching him die. He's watching his dying process. He saw how he treated people who were his enemies. He began to learn something about God. He began to learn something about the nature of God. The Apostle Paul said that I might know him. Jeremiah says, to know the Lord. He said, there's nothing greater you can ever know on this earth than to know the Lord. God's not up here with a hammer to beat you to death. He's not digging a trap to catch you in. He's not after you to overtake you and take you away. 
If God is against you, you don't stand a chance. None of us do tonight. The nature of God is what we, what we deal with. Do we know Him? How much better do we know Him? How much more have we learned about Him? I submit to you tonight, if you've been saved any length of time, you know more about Him now than you did when you were saved. He's different. He's God. Think about this for a moment. Nobody knows the essence of a spirit. Nobody. You have no idea if God's not standing right here. I'm not talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. But you have no idea of how much space God the Father encompasses. He's ever present. He's everywhere. When the Lord Jesus Christ took upon himself a body and became a man like us, that meant that he had limited himself to being at the right hand of the Father. But the, through the power of the Holy Spirit of God, we're talking about a spirit being that literally fills the universe. There's not a place that you can't find him. Though I make my bed in hell, David said, thou art there. Now at the right hand of the, of, at the Father is the Lord Jesus. He's the God-man. You know that. He's God manifest in flesh, God incarnate. You're able to see that invisible, eternal, almighty, absolute being in Christ. Otherwise, you'd never see him. You wouldn't even know he existed apart from the creation. And so now this thief hangs on the cross and he looks over at this man. And he's not completely ignorant of him. He no doubt had heard about him because of some of the things that he says. I want you to notice what he says. He said, Lord, remember me. It's a simple prayer. It's a very simple prayer. I have a lot of people say, Preacher, how can a man be saved? Somebody's got to lead him to the Lord. The Lord will lead you to the Lord. I want to make that as plain as I possibly can. The Lord will lead you to the Lord. You don't have to follow anybody's formula to be saved. The Lord will lead you to the Lord. That's in the depths of your soul that cries out for help. That's God speaking. When you get into the darkness and you don't know which way to go, God speaks. When you're lying flat to your back and you hope, people have given up on you. The church gave up on you. Religion's given up on you. God can begin to move in your heart. You find God at the most extreme places, the extremities, the places where you literally have given up hope. There's no hope. No hope. Then you're at a good place because God is the God of hope that can come to you when men can't. Men will give up. Men will give up on you. They'll deal with you so long and then they just get frustrated and they'll quit. Not God. Not God. You see, this is his nature manifest at the cross. And it cannot be manifest in a more simple way and a powerful way. This thief said, Lord, remember me. That's all he said. He, uh, Romans chapter number 10 hadn't even been written. Remember. When this thief said, Lord, remember me, the only Bible that existed was Genesis through Malachi. There weren't any New Testament scriptures. None of that. But he knew that that man right over there was different. That's what changed him. You see, he was a male factor and he was a criminal and he screamed and yelled and he mocked him and made fun of him until he began to realize who he really was. Our problem, it's a major problem, it's a vast problem, is that we want to present our religion to people. We want them to, cor to conform to our standards, our projection, our understanding of Christ. He doesn't need me to tell him who he is. That's the work of the Holy Ghost. He'll tell you who Christ is. Notice something that he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Well, good night, man. All these apostles were out here running and hiding. And in Acts chapter number 1, they said to the Lord Jesus, Will thou at this time restore again to us the kingdom? You see, their concept of the kingdom and the, and the concept of the thief on the cross was in two entirely different things. The thief on the cross understood that Christ had a kingdom and that he could be in that kingdom. And notice when he said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. At that very, just, just within a few hours, moments, you're going to be in my kingdom, and it's paradise. Now, paradise connects it with the garden from Genesis all the way through Revelation. 
The garden's quite a thing when you think about it. It's a beautiful place. That's where God put the man that he made to begin with, put him in there to dress it and keep it. He gave him something to do. The garden is a wonderful thing because there's never another garden like it anywhere. And he said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. There are those that teach Christ went to hell. They say he went to hell and there in hell he, he finished your atonement. He made the atonement. He finished your salvation in hell. That's pure blasphemy. Your atonement was made at the cross at Calvary. The shedding of the blood of Christ is the atonement, folks. There's no blood shed in hell. There's no blood shed in paradise. The blood was shed at the cross. It started at Gethsemane. That's when he started bleeding. But the, ton the, the, the new covenant, the covenant of blood, the covenant of the blood of Jesus Christ was ratified, made, brought into legality at the cross. At the cross. The Apostle Paul later on, when he looked back at that cross, and I don't know if any of them standing around had a clue, but the Apostle Paul, when he wrote in his epistles years later about that event at the cross, says God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. In other words, he lifted up their understanding of the cross. There's the physical cross, cross that they were looking at. Then there's the spiritual reality of it. Paul taught that. So the thief said, Lord, remember me. Think about it for a moment. Think about it. Of all these people standing around the cross and yelling, screaming, you know, vitriol coming from their mouth, hatred, and all of this, and, they're, and it's directed toward the Lord Jesus. He didn't answer him a word. Not a single word. He didn't say a word to them. Not a word. Not a word. But to one thief, one thief who cried out for help, one thief, he had an immediate answer. Now, God may wait a while to answer some of your prayers. You can pray and talk to the Lord and seek his face about certain things. It may take him a while to answer, but I'll tell you something. You get serious with God, he's immediately serious with you. I say, preacher, what's, what's, what kind of sinner's prayer could, should, a, should, a, should a person say to get right with God? I mean, what? Remember me? That's all he said. Well, I mean, that, that's okay, but there's more than that. Not really. He's looking at the Savior. There's only one Savior. Remember me. And that did it. Now, the Jews had what's called a mikvah. If you go to the uh, Temple Mount, you'll find that the steps are still there that lead to the top of the mount. 2,000 years old, the steps. I've walked up them a number of times. At the base of the steps, the archaeologists have found what's called mikvahs. What's a mikvah? A mikvah is a Jewish ritual cleansing site. Remember now, it's a ritual. The Jews went through the mikvah. They went through a ceremonial cleansing. And then they went to the top of the mount. And there, there they went to the temple, offered sacrifices. But that ritual cleansing did not save them. The just shall be saved by his faith. That's what it says in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, he dropped one word, his. Just shall live by faith. Just shall be saved by faith. Trust the Lord. Call on his name. Simple thing. God didn't make it complicated. Man does. But it's a wonderful thing when you think this man couldn't do any more than he did. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He must have been in terrible agony when he said that. But it was a simple prayer from the heart. Don't ever let anybody flim flam you into going through some kind of a, some kind of a religious ritual before you are approved as a Christian. Get man out of it. Get him out of it. Get him out of it. Get him as far as you can out of it. And all you got to do is say, Lord, remember me. I want you to know something about this. It's quite remarkable. Some of the old divines used to make comments about this. They said, here's a man on his deathbed. Now we got a deathbed conversion. This is hope for those who have no hope because it did happen. But it's the only time it happened. It happened one time, though. 
And one time's enough if that individual fits the bill. You mean to tell me, preacher, that I can be saved on my deathbed? You may be able to. It depends on who you are. It depends on the circumstances. This is why we never give up hope. We don't give up hope. We pray. Now, how do you know? Somebody said, well, I'm pretty sure I just couldn't get so-and-so to pray with me and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. Yeah, but I'll, they don't need to pray with you. They need to talk to God. <laughs> they need to talk to God. Talk to Him. He'll hear you. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Can you imagine when they left this world? The two of them went together. Lord left first. He, you know, he's already gone. Six hours is all he hung there. He left first. And he went down to paradise. Wasn't long though. Here comes the thief right behind him. Right behind him. Into paradise. My, what a thing. What a change. He went to the cross and was nailed on the tree as a male factor, as a, as a criminal, as a thief, as, a, as an off-scouring, a curse on the earth with no hope. He's going to die an ignominious death. And yet he winds up in paradise that very day. <laughs> That's where I'm going. But it's not down here now. You all know by reading the Bible. He led captivity captive, gave gifts to men. Who is this that approaches unto God? And Antiphony they sing, and the Son of God arises into the very presence of the Father. And he takes with him his own. Lord, remember me. Some of your best prayers are one or two words. They really are. I pray the Lord's Prayer, and some folks, they make a mock of it. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thou art the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, no, shut up. If you mean that from your heart, there's nothing wrong with that. Well, I don't know, preacher. It's not really dispensationally, uh, theologically sound. It's not. You see what happens to people? They get so tied up. Yeah. They, get, they really do. Yeah. They really do. Our brother, Sunday, you remember over here, Brother uh, uh, John Wright, he was singing a song written by a Nazarene. Yeah. You need to go out there and say, you know what they're singing over there at Temple Baptist Church? They're singing songs written by Nazarenes. I hate to tell you tonight, Fanny Crosby was not a Baptist. <laughs> but she was a believer. And so was the Nazarene that wrote that song that Brother Wright. You say, well, then, are you against the Baptist church? No, I want you to have freedom of your thoughts, freedom of your mind. I want you to be firmly settled in your own mind. What do you believe? What do you believe? Where are you at? Why are you, why are you here? What do you believe? Let every man fully persuaded. You study, you read, you pray, you seek the face of the Lord. I can look around other churches and see the way the folks do, and I know I don't belong there. I don't belong there. I'm not condemning the people and saying they don't know the Lord, but I don't belong there. That's not me. I'm where I should be. That's the way it ought to be. That's what it's about. Amen. When you have freedom of conscience, and I have believe in freedom of speech, I believe in it. Though most of them up there on Capitol Hill don't, I believe in freedom of speech. And this is why a blasphemer and a, and a, and a Christ denier in the, co in the country, as far as, as citizenship is concerned, he has every right to say whatever he pleases. But I've got a right to preach the gospel. Amen. That's the way it ought to work. It has to work that way or it won't work at all. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He called him Lord. He knew he had a kingdom. He knew that all he'd heard about him and refused to believe had come true right before his very eyes. <laughs> yeah. And in the darkness, remember this now, it is so dark you can't see your hand before your face. And he hears the voice come back. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. I can't help but believe that he just shook a little bit. Because man could not help him anymore. Now if you're here tonight. You don't have to be a dispensationalist. You don't even have to know how many books are in the Bible. 
Truth is, you don't even have to know if there's a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Fact is, you don't even have to know who Abraham was. Well, what do I need to know, preacher? Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. It's about our Lord Jesus Christ, folks. I'm up here because I have to be up here. Forget I'm up here. Forget me. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. It's a simple prayer like that that you may have never prayed. But you can. You can. Notice carefully now. This crowd, this mob standing around, they didn't do anything to help this thief. Nobody was trying to lead him to the Lord. Not a word was said to him. Nothing. I mean, he's just howling over there and then he shuts up. And the very one that he'd been cursing and blaspheming turned around and showed him mercy. Are you there? How many years have you spent cursing and blaspheming his holy name? Oh, preacher, oh, you just wouldn't believe. There ain't no way God wouldn't have a thing to do with me. Why, good night, I've treated him like a dog, talked to, cursed him to his face. Why, there's no way the Lord have anything to do with me. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Boy, boy. Oh, boy. You say, preacher, you're trying to make it uh, not too hard to be saved. That's right, I am. I'm trying to make it as biblically sound as I possibly can. You're saved because you look to the Lord Jesus as your Savior, and however you do it, you receive Him into your heart. You put your trust in Him, your faith in Him. That's what He was doing. Lord, remember me. He's putting His trust in Him. He's putting His faith in Him when Thou comest into Thy kingdom. Oh, the blessed Son of God. The nature of God shows forth, it shines forth in that darkness like you wouldn't believe. When the Lord Jesus Christ said, Today, today, He came to seek and save that which is lost. He's not a, he's not, he doesn't carry His feelings on His shoulder. He's the Almighty. He's the Son of God. He's God manifest in the flesh. He is the direct access to the Father. Without Christ, you cannot access the Father. No man knows the Father but the Son. No man knows the Son but the Father. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for this about thief on the cross. How he got saved. How he understood the kingdom of Christ better than the apostles did. I understood that he simply looked at him. He didn't say he believed a lot of stuff. He just looked at him and said, Lord, remember me. Remember me. There may be some soul crying out to you tonight, Lord. That's all they know to say. They don't know what else to say. They've made all kinds of promises to you, and they broke every one of them. They've trusted something that they've done, and it's failed them. They've trusted the arm of the flesh. It will surely fail. But they muster up just a little bit tonight to say, Lord, remember me. That's all they got to do. That's all this thief did. Lord, remember me. Remember me. In your holy name. Now, keep your heads bowed for a moment. Would anybody in this house tonight say, Lord, remember me. Remember me. God bless you. Yes, sir. God bless you. God bless you. Lord, remember me. Remember me. It's a simple prayer. I don't get more. How in the world can you get any more simple than that? Lord, remember me. That's the way God deals with you. He deals with you on the basis of truth, reality, simplicity. Paul talked about the simplicity that's in Christ. He talked about that. Lord, remember me. Anybody else? If folks are watching this thing tonight, you're watching us stream this, I can't see you, but you can see me. Why don't you do that too if you need to? Lord, remember me, because I'm going to pray right now. Lord, remember me. Father, in thy name, you know who I am, Lord. I'm nothing but a servant. That's what I am, and I'm happy to be that. My life is totally fulfilled. I am as happy as a man can be just to be a servant. And Father, I pray now for those who are calling upon your name. Your word has gone forth. It's been simple. It's, in very, it's a simple thing. 
And when man gets a hold of this, he begins to spin it and, and change the complete meaning of it. But what we have given out tonight, Lord, is as close as I can possibly humanly get to show how simple this salvation was. Lord, remember me. And I pray they'll pray that if anybody's doubting their salvation, anybody's been, anybody's been browbeaten by some religious crowd, there's somebody out there watching this thing now or will watch it later. Let them pray this simple prayer with me. This simple prayer. Lord, remember me. In thy holy name I pray. Amen.